Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. Everyone, welcome to Live Stream of Consciousness, Episode 5. Uh, Naomi, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I mean, my name is Naomi. I am a human being. <laughs> I also have a vocation, which people often use to introduce themselves. So I work as an occupational therapist, a college professor, and an editor. And uh, I guess we'll learn more about me as we go on with the stream. Oh, are we both going to learn more about you? Maybe, probably. <laughs> so what's on your mind? There's always a lot on my mind. I don't know what other people's experiences are, but pretty much at any given time, there's something going on. Uh, I always have a song going through my head. So I have um, Satisfied from the musical Hamilton. I've been going you through know, my head today. You know, it's, it seems like required viewing if one's interested in music and politics, right? Yeah, yeah. It, even though, you know, it's been in the cultural zeitgeist for a while and people have had plenty of time to respond to it. I mean, with any cultural milestones like that, it's still very much worth going back and looking at it and thinking about how it's shaped the conversation. And it's just a really good musical. Like, How has it shaped the conversation? you're asking some pretty good questions you're 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 throwing me the the fastballs uh, right at the well, what, what did it make you think about Hamilton well it makes me think about it came on when it came onto the scene right I, I can't even remember how long has it been since Hamilton came out do you remember that's what I was trying to place it uh, now that you mentioned because I was thinking I wonder what was happening exactly contemporary with the release <laughs> I can't ex exactly remember, but I can remember. I'm not the greatest at dates, but I I see you're Googling. Uh, yeah, I'm mean, doing so, some real time research. Yeah, um, but you know, kind of in terms of subjective memory, I think Hamilton came Hamilton, on. Ontario, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> it came on the scene and the whole conversation. I, I was going to say five years. You know, I was thinking 2015 and I there also was thinking, I don't want to make a fool of myself, uh, yeah. you know, on Facebook Live or well, wherever almost, we are. It's almost, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be on Facebook later. Um, this is a, this is like a stream of consciousness that's not quite alive yet, but ah, um, it's okay. almost six years ago now that, that it came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I think that at the time it was the idea of, you know, let's tell, let's tell the tale of the American foundation myth, but with a diverse cast. And I think that it definitely paved the way for a lot more diverse or I guess, I don't really like this term, but colorblind casting. And, but it was also making the point of, you know, the importance of immigration and how, you know, yeah, I think that's plus like everyone is incredibly talented and it kind of showcased that talent and how you know there is a lot there and perhaps there was a lot of barriers in the musical or theater world that were getting in the way of people being out there and and doing amazing things and so yeah i think like it's really made i don't know if it's made an impact on politics per yeah, se to I be wonder. honest but but like society sure yeah because i guess i wonder about because it seems like there was a time when a musicals had a bit more political force and so did rock music like in the late 60s wh whether you're looking at like you know um uh, you know peter paul and mary or hair it's like the different kinds of politically active music and um the impression that i've gotten is that since that period music has been progressively commodified in a kind of divide and conquer kind of approach that's kind of been applied to pop culture generally like everything's been turned into a little parcel though product as opposed to like oh a, a movement that would threaten the established political order or something like that and so i feel like musicals are probably i i, I feel like like the, the the politically perfect musical would still be in a situation where the musical industry as a whole has already been robbed of some of its political power potential political power mm -hmm. M maybe i'm wrong maybe the next maybe the next revolution will start with a musical <laughs> i <laughs> <Eight>. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know, but you're right because there's so many stakeholders in terms of what it, and, and so much time involved in what it takes to make a musical. I think Lynn manuel Miranda was working on it for a, a decade, the, the script for the well, musical. Like, and then these days, musicals reach a largely privileged audience regardless of who they employ yep yeah um and that's like that's to do kind of with the funding model you know of like yeah i mean you, you could say that rock is just has the illusion of, of being an alternative to that of, of of oh look like with counter counterculture i mean it was <laughs> i think that's what makes it actually kind of serves to make counterculturally counterculturally or whatever, I can't remember exactly where I was going with that, but the idea that musicals that are kind of like, I think about Rent and I think about <laughs> here they are like, you know, saying, you know, fuck the system and, and it's like, it's so sanitized at the same time that it makes yeah. it kind of cringy almost in a way, right? Yeah, well, it seems like that happened to rap as well. Like if you compare like early 80s to like, say the year 2000 in rap or something like that um like like public enemy was was very um it, it, it seemed to have some some very direct connection to to politically what was what was going on and well you know like they weren't rapping about just making a lot of money and that kind of thing which is you know it's that's that, that, that once you're just rapping about bling it seems to just sort of reinforce the capitalist value system well said but, but what do i what, what do i know i know <laughs> I mean, who doesn't like money, right? I mean, this is your, I'm out of my scope here. I have to say I'm not um, a con consumer of a lot of rap. There's some rap I like, um, but yeah, I think that speak, some of it speaks to me and some of it doesn't and that stuff speaks to me less, although it speaks to plenty of people, which is great. Um, but uh, I, think, I think a lot of musicians wonder if they're doing enough politically because they think like, well, music, does music really, you know, like I love music, but like I also like want the world to get better or whatever. And and I think, I think um, I don't know. I, I I'm inclined to think that every artist wants to have a political impact with their art, on some level. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe really. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I mean, not necessarily on electoral politics, but like I I think I think like 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 if your art has an effect, regardless of the medium you want that effect to be positive on the world to like, you don't want your art to make no difference. You want to make a difference, but a, a positive difference. And, you know, to the extent that you construe it in like a general way, you, you end up thinking of it like politically in a sense, like it's like societal as opposed to just like, like, I, I don't, I don't mean that it's as, as opposed to like your personal message or something like that. Like, it's not as though like personal honesty is a politics. It's not like, uh, Oh, like, because you do, as opposed to propaganda, where it's like, we are creating this with this desired result in mind. You know, like that's, I, I, that's, some people would want to say, like, there's art and then there's propaganda, and that, like, good art needs to be politically engaged, but not in the way that propaganda is, is um, what I'm getting at the basic uh, contrast there, art versus propaganda. Right. I don't know if I would agree that all art is political because I, I think as a person who makes art, for me, it's mostly, I would like people to enjoy it um, or make, make art can cause people to be, feel pleasure, feel happy. Um, I am trying to think about what you said and I think well, do, do it depends. Feel like they want to be creative too? Sorry? Do you want people who experience your creativity to be inspired to also be creative? Not, not, not necessarily. I mean, I write music and I think music for me is a, just a, kind of a pure emotional expression. And so at the very, I just want people to go on a journey where maybe they feel something similar. Um, but with writing, I would say that's different because writing is very much verbal and there's themes and there's characters and things happen. And I, I, I would agree with you or argue that literature cannot be apolitical. Hmm if you wanted to, to, to tie that in, right? Music, maybe not so much, but so I think it depends on the genre of art. Well, it certainly also comes in degrees. Like there's, there's certainly some music is a lot more political than others, which is, I guess, part of what I was originally wondering about is like, you know, like 
like Hamilton's overtly political, but that doesn't necessarily make it more politically effective. The fact that it's explicitly about politics, uh, you, you see what I mean? Like it's not necessarily, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily better artistic politics for your artist, for, for your art to be more explicitly political. You know, maybe, maybe like maybe if Hamilton had been recast in some mythic terms, maybe people would generalize from the narrative more as opposed to like, oh, this is the specific story of the specific historical person. It's pretty heavy theme, like general themes, like the theme of time, right? The, the theme of like, what do I do with my life? Burning a candle at both ends, um, be having a public facing, how your public facing persona interacts with your personal persona. But maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm reading all this and then everybody else is like, yeah, founding fathers, America. So I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. America. <laughs> What, what, what I what I would say, I, I mean, I know that partly it, it's a it's partly a definition game of like how broadly you want to define the word political and like it, it does shift around for political reasons, <laughs> but um, <coughs> at least for certain definitions of it. Um, but but I, I I wanted I wanted to follow on from what you said about music, um, you know, writing music out of a hope that someone will feel something similar. Yeah. And so, to, to me, that to, if if that's contrasted with music for a political purpose, I would ask that question, well, what is the politics of people feeling similar, right? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that's obvious, right? Empathy, <laughs> connectedness, uh, yeah, community, yeah. right? Bringing people together is a productive politic, in my opinion. I mean, not that every, not that all human relationships need to be productive, but since we're viewing it through that lens, right? If somebody is, listening to a piece of music and somebody else is listening to a piece of music and they can share that if people share emotional experiences i think um as long, especially positive ones but even negative in the form of like our catharsis which music provides i think that does give more common ground to people it allows like music is such a it's a fun it's like the universal means of communication because everyone can engage in music even though people may speak different languages yeah i mean I it, it take it still takes some effort, but I, th I think it's easier to learn a musical language than it is to learn a natural language. Like, like yeah, you know, like there's different scales and and genres, modalities. Yeah, I agree, but the, the whole debate about just how universal music universals are, and so like like for instance, like um, in some folk music, the minor scale is the happy one, and the Phrygian is the sad one. But it's still in general the scale. If you have two main scales that you use, the one with the lower notes is the sadder one. Um, because like sad speech is kind of lower uh, in pitch and energy and so on. Um, uh, so there's like, it's not a music universal that minor is sad, but it is a, a music universal that lower pitch is a sadder scale uh, of the scales that you're, you, so it's, you know, it, it, it'll depend on what level of description it, it's universal. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I do think, I, I, you know, like, like for instance, uh, growing up being inspired by Nobumatsu's music in the Final Fantasy games, it's like, I didn't speak Japanese. I mean, the game was translated. They didn't translate the music though. They didn't have to, tra I mean, in, in a way the music was translated because Umatsu was heavily influenced by Western music and his influence from Japanese music is more subconscious because in reality he's kind of like, oh, I didn't really, I don't really listen to Japanese music. It's like, well, you're probably, you probably hear quite a lot of it compared to how much I hear. <laughs> and to him, it's like, no, I don't listen to it. Like, like he, I guess he means in like in a focused way, like in a pursuing, like he's, into Elton John and stuff like that. <laughs> hmm. that was like cheesier interests. Yeah. yeah, I almost wonder if like, you know, musical creoles can appear a lot more quickly than language-based creoles, if that makes sense. Like when you call it, you look at genre blending and inspiration, the conversation can have, can go a lot more quickly, I think. I'd, I'd, I'd hope so and expect so. That yeah, musical creolization would be faster than natural language creolization. I'd be very surprised if there was like a, and I feel like it's going to speed up. I mean, I mean, if you just look at the rate of genre change in music history, like in Western music, it's it's just gotten faster and faster. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I guess it kind of slowed down after the '90s. There's been a kind of a homogenization of a lot of genres. Since I, I don't mean into each other, but like. I don't know. I feel, I feel like music genres and Facebook stopped changing at around the same time. They were like, oh, but we're done. We've <laughs> They've finally perfected the formula. 
Yeah, I guess basic was changing a bit after 2010 and music it started. Well, because because they started taking fewer risks with music for a couple of reasons. There was less money to go around because of piracy and Napster and everything. So they were more risk averse than even before. Um, and that was that was already projected that it started like more risk aversion. And they started using hit prediction algorithms to try to predict what's going to be a hit. And, and once they started using these, the top 10, like say of the Billboard top 100, got more and more homogenous over time because the way these hit prediction algorithms work are just by trying to measure how similar something was to the hits of the previous year. And yet, I would argue <laughs> uh, that every so often somebody comes by, like, I don't know, I guess my question is how unique is Billie Eilish? Because I feel like a lot of people are not expecting that style of music to be so universally popular. Well, yeah, because I, I feel like in this in this like market system, individual voices peek through now and then. Like, like at the time when I noticed going through the billboard hits year by year, the top 10 getting more homogenous, there, uh, when that was happening, also Lady Gaga was happening and she didn't sound like the rest of the hits. She sounded like Lady mm -hmm. Gaga because she's like a person. <laughs> like a, you, did, did you know there are bands, there's at least one band that had songs on the radio and then they went to David Cope, one of the music AI pioneers and asked him to make a new song in their previous style using his AI techniques and to sign a contract saying that he would keep it secret. And, and <laughs> the song is, has been on the radio. So there is, there's, there is a band out there that at least one of their songs was actually written by a computer and it's a secret. It's, it's like not a secret that it exists, but it's a secret which band and song it is. Mm. And so, and nobody was like, now hold a second, this one song sounds different. You know, it's, it's the touring test has already passed in that case. Huh, interesting. From, from uh, human. Huh. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really bother me. Uh, not that that was what you were asking, but <laughs> I think, Why? I mean, the honestly, on the other hand, everyone, as we're demonstrating right now with a computer or a camera or a phone, could record whatever they like and put it wherever they want. The only thing that you have to contend with is the algorithm. So you have to be, you know, if you want to be finding new artists, you kind of have to Either you have to be really giving the com like your computer some weird parameters. Like I always wonder about my Spotify, right? I'm like if I could see what they're trying, I guess it it doesn't work. I know that like machine learning doesn't work like this, uh -huh. but if I could, you know, um, anthropomorphize the machine learning, I'm like she like just send her stuff with a thousand or less plays. Like she seems to like that stuff. Nice. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, I don't know, but uh, at the end of the day, you can also, there's also like anti-algorithm techniques that you can use to uncover new and cool and developing artists and, and uh, creative works. Um, and so, yeah, there is, a, and obviously there's an equal opportunity. Well, after but... COVID, people can discover music locally again. <laughs> I mean, I, I discovered a lot of music just from going out in Toronto that I would have never discovered via the internet directly. Uh, local, in terms of local artists. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, I mean, uh, online has a, has a bias towards like a, 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 like more of a, I mean, it's not nearly as much as it used to be of a bias towards like one main narrative. There's a lot more long tail and all these different niches sort of fragmented online, but it's, um, but there's no particular bias towards where you are in most music, music recommendation systems or whatever, like Spotify or like, I mean, YouTube recommends me stuff, but it's not particularly locally focused. You know, I go on Wikipedia, that's not lo locally focused. Uh, Pirate Bay is not locally focused. You know, Usenet wouldn't be if you went on there. I used to find a lot of music just from what people posted on news groups back in the day. Just like stuff I would never have thought to look up. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, hard, it's hard to replicate that kind of thing now with the super recommendation algorithms. Like Amazon won't tell you what book you're going to hate because they want you to like it and buy it. You know. <laughs> It's an, you know, it's interesting. And I think everyone has a different tolerance or desire for that. I think part of me feels like, oh, this is great. Like I don't have to waste my time buying or reading a book that I'm not gonna like, but it doesn't, it's not right all the time. And then sometimes you're homogenizing your experience. And so like I started a book club with my mom recently and I'm reading books I would have just never thought I would be interested in and I'm enjoying them. So I think a bit of a balance between it's nice to make this nice to feel like you're making this big machine work for you, 
um, but to break out of that every so often and get some novelty. And, you know, I mean, I'm not going to be able to remember the stats specifically, but it was like somebody took a bunch of cell phone data and was able to predict with 90% accuracy where people were going to be in the following week, just based on their patterns. Like people have routines, they know what they know, they're comfortable with that. And so I guess how tolerant are you or how much do you want the novelty? There is a little bit of like, yeah, there's a danger or a risk. It's not like the risk is you may not like it, but I guess it depends on whether you feel like that is a waste of your time to have an experience that you don't like, which I don't feel like, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, the, the, I mean, the big risk is, is just complete um, isolation in political bubbles and echo chambers, right? Like, like, like you, you might think music's not the biggest driver of that, or, or like, even if you might think it should be, if music should be political or whatnot, but like just in terms of the algorithms in general, I mean, um, like with Cambridge Analytica and these politically micro-targeted ads using leveraging personality psychology, it's also leveraging the fact that you can show different ads to every person or different patterns of ads. You don't have to have a one one TV station that everybody watches. Like, like there is Fox News, but like that's just level one manipulation. Level two is when everybody's got their own personal Fox News that like makes them their own personal brand of crazy as long as they vote the correct way, you know. <laughs> And, and it's not to say that there isn't, you know, crazy making on, on both sides driven at the end of just producing the desired voting behavior or the desired consumer behavior, you know. Um, and so because there's this, uh, you know, they call it the daily me years ago. Um, th th there's this, th there's this, um, people can be put into even more constrictive echo chambers than, than before. Like, like, like Facebook colluding with the right kind of political advertiser could put somebody in an echo chamber of one fairly readily. Um, not, not that they systematically do this now, but if they wanted to, they could. You know, if they just said, look, look, we're Facebook, we decided to be evil, we're going to, you know, uh, disconnect Naomi from reality. We are going to show her a weird sample of news. We're going to filter, you know, well, and, and they did ex emotional experiments on people, right? Like Facebook had a whole thing where I don't think they even ever debriefed anybody and said your your timeline was subjected to emotional experiments but they did they wanted to see if they could induce specific emotions in people by altering the distribution of things in their newsfeed um and i don't know it's like i don't know where, where that the ethics board is for doing these kinds of experiments on people when you're like running this like social network uh as, as a private company and being like let's see if we can make yeah you happier or sadder or angrier or i mean it's uncharted territory, I think, in terms of research ethics, right? Yeah, I think it's, I guess, the word deliberate versus like, is it intent? What is intended and what is not? I mean, a social network was, is not made with the intention of manipulating people's emotions, but advertising is. But we don't need uh, an ethics board to approve an advertisement. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what to make of that. Yeah, I mean, there's some restrictions on advertisement, but yeah. Yeah, but like not, you know, you can try to manipulate people's emotions or manipulate their psychology and their behavior as much as you can with an, as much as you'd like with an advertisement, unfortunately. And same goes for these algorithms as there is no, we don't have a response to the fact that we know that they're manipulating people emotionally and or mentally. We have these ideas of the, these radicalized, like, boomers and other rattle like these folks getting more and more down this rabbit hole yeah i mean i'm trying to i don't know maybe this is a a well-meaning yet misguided effort but just you know to acknowledge sometimes there are there are echo chambers on the left too there's okay. the left and the right like and, and both of them have issues of their own so I don't know where that leaves us. Um, well, I, I think as a, as a matter of like self-defense, everybody needs contradictory sources. Because, um, you know, if, if all of your sources agree, they could be colluding with each other. Okay, so, so I try to do this, right? I'd be interested to see what your experience has been. So, for example, like as a person who works in healthcare, I'm like very much pro public health measures and keeping people safe. But I happened to stumble into a subreddit called the new normal. And, you know, 
maybe I'm maybe I'm proving my own point, but I started to realize people don't people see masks as government control. They see government control as bad, um, and <laughs> it, it, I don't know. Like I, I, I'm the more time I spend in there, I don't agree with their mostly because I feel like a lot of them are American. <laughs> I mean, not that I know that for a fact. Or a um, very specific definition. But it's like, yeah, I mean, we're, there isn't such thing as total and complete freedom. Like the people who are anti-maskers, do they, do, are they anti-red lights, <laughs> right? Like, do they, they do they not stop for traffic or, or do they not have to give up some of their freedom to accommodate the fact that they live in a community yeah. of people. Well, the but thing is this American idea of liberty is, is so-called negative liberty, um, where it, it, freedom means no one actively interferes with you as opposed to you're supported so that you're, you're, you're free to do what you would need that support to do. Like, like, mm. like po positive liberty, where like the government actively does things to make you more free. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like, like for instance, a basic income would increase people's positive liberty by enabling say like people at the lower end of the wealth distribution to have a, a buffer so they can take the risk of starting new projects and this kind of thing you know um but it, if it increases taxation in a way then it reduces negative liberty because there's more interference mm -hmm. uh, it's just like you have to actively take somebody's money to, to fund this program let's say mm -hmm. you can do it indirectly by printing money but anyway Anyway, so I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I don't think that's a long term or sustainable well, solution. It, it, it's, it's, it's an indirect tax. Like the inflation mm. is, is like a tax, uh, I think. I, 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 if there's a, a, a significant difference, it's, it's not for all purposes at any rate. Um, but yeah, this American ideal of, of freedom is a specific kind of freedom, like a negative liberty of like, in fact, I, I, just, uh, I just learned that the first US penny had the motto on it, mind your own business. <laughs> That's a, that's a certain kind of, of freedom of like, hmm. everybody mind your own business. That's one, one kind of freedom. But yeah. of course, what's your own business is changes in this respiratory airborne situation. Um, but, but it's in this context of, of already, there, there's already a uh, thought terminating, not thought coming clear saying there's, there's some process which prevents alternative definitions of freedom from being discussed because there's a fixation on a certain conception of freedom that's like the American conception of freedom, uh, especially with libertarianism in America being specifically right libertarianism. Like in Europe, there's left and right libertarianism. In America, libertarianism means right-wing libertarianism uh, because freedom means this particular kind of freedom. Like it's the same kind of conflation that there's one kind of freedom and there's one kind of liberty, libertarianism, is, is government leave me alone as opposed to government help me be free, like with positive contributions, um, or you know, because like you know, an education system produces positive. Or you spend money on it, and it it makes people more free by giving them the the knowledge that they need. the truth will set you free. But where are you going to learn it? You got to fund that school somehow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's but the truth will set you free. That's a different kind of free than like we'll leave you alone, uh, <laughs> not not bug you. It's like well. Okay, but like if nobody bugs you and makes you learn something you don't want to learn, then you will be less free later. I mean, it's kind of like the whole lockdown thing is that if we had given up more freedom initially with a so-called circuit breaker lockdown in the first place, we'd be much better. We'd have much more freedom now. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a dynamic system, and I there is no such thing as pure like the ability to literally go and do whatever you want it just can't it's just not sustainable um but on the other hand you don't like it's, it's a spectrum right um and i totally i feel like my i've had restrictions on my freedom over the past year <laughs> like um it's i have to go out and work with people in the cold and the rain and there's nowhere to go to warm up and i mean not, you know, I'm sure, and then not to say, you know, there's other people who are going through much worse than me, but, you know, just the, just the feeling of safety. I don't have a feeling of safety in my community anymore that I feel like I had more of prior to the pandemic. Like, yeah, there's nowhere, I don't feel like the only safe space is my apartment. I have to go out into this world and navigate all these difficulties. I can't, I don't want to go in the 
I'm not going on the TTC or the bus. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's just, <laughs> and I wear, wearing a mask, you know, it, it's not always pleasant. It's not a big deal for me, but, um, and then just, yeah, the restrictions on spending time with family and people that I love, but I'm still doing it <laughs> because, you know, I think sometimes it's, these are the visible things, but there's the in, uh, intangible or long-term piece that we're looking at. There's also just the idea of like how, how much do you care about people you don't know? Right. And some people don't, and some people do more than others. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I, for me, because I do care about pe people other than that I don't know. Maybe, maybe I don't care enough, I don't know, but I, I feel like to some extent I do. And so that's why I do these, the things that I'm doing. I'm not really, I am a little, would not be, I don't know, I, I have a, what, 1% chance of dying from the coronavirus. But I don't know, the, I'm not, I, I, where am I trying to get with yeah, this? Less I, than 1% in the, these days, you know. Basically. Less than 1%. So what do I care if I, I could just get it. I could get, I remember I used to have those thoughts, like, I just want to get it, I'll get it over with. I'll be immune. I don't have to worry. But it just doesn't work like that because I, COVID. that doesn't mean everything, all the stores are going to open. That doesn't mean everyone else is going to be okay. So it just doesn't work like that, you know? I mean, there, there was some suggestion in here and there in a blog article or two of, well, why can't we have a system of the vulnerable people go into lockdown? But that was- Yeah, they already are. That's what a long-term care center is. Well, it, it's, it's a lockdown for, for seniors. Like they, they're not allowed to leave. People in institutions are, were already not allowed to leave and they were segregated and isolated from society. So don't really know what much more you're gonna do at this point to well, they, isolate seniors because we are already isolating them a lot, right? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it depends on, I, th I think initially the wishful thinking was like, you know, maybe young people really are safe from it, but actually it's not clear what the long-term effects are. I mean, I mean, um, like we don't we don't know what it does to people's life expectancy if they catch COVID and get you know long COVID for a while and you know or there's like could reduce your lung function uh, go, going forward into your life and and so but anyway but they, they they there used to be more wishful thinking of like well maybe we just have to protect old people so so maybe there could be a system where actually you just don't have like in person visitation at, at care homes until the vaccine is made kind of thing obviously. You know, I mean, some people are already in that situation mm. with, with people at, at the end of life, and so on. I don't know. But who's I mean, taking I've, care of them? Sorry, it's not other oh, seniors. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah, not yeah, seniors yeah. taking care of other seniors. Yeah, so so it's, it's, a, it's a fanciful notion, I think, being bandied about because it, it, yeah, it has this unrealistic picture of what the social network. It, it's not like it's not just a room with old people in it. <laughs> I think that that because that must that must be the the. Yeah, that must be the the worldview behind the, essentially behind that kind of article, um, which which you know the art the argument wasn't made too often. The, the circuit breaker lockdowns that was proposed more often, and also when there was limited testing, um, there could have been more group testing because you can pool tests and like basically basically you put all the blood together and and test it, and if it's negative, everybody's negative, uh, but if hmm. it's positive, you like break it into half or whatever. And, so like, you know, they could have been doing that in, in the first place, I think, to, to save, save on that. And I don't know, a, lo a lot of things that we could have done differently, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. We could have but had capacity in hospitals. You could have had what? We could have had surge capacity in hospitals. I just got the flu vaccine. I mean, that might help. I don't, I don't want to get the flu. And then, I mean, not that I'm going to end up in the hospital from the flu, but I could give it to somebody else and they could have the hospital and take up the spot. So like, yeah. uh, might as well not, not get the flu. That one, that one must be safe, right? The flu, I know, flu vaccine never hurt anybody as far as I know. So like, whatever, take it. <laughs> and get, unfortunately, right again, it's a whole piece around statistics. If I have a negative reaction, it's going to be very, very small chance. It's a lower chance than, right? It's, it's better than the alternative. That's the whole point of vaccines. Like you yeah. can't say they're completely free of side effects. And some people... Could have some difficult difficulties after getting a vaccine not really sure can't really comment on those uh except definitely that autism is not caused by vaccines but at the end of the day it's 
the problem is like we're very psychologically set up to uh, feel regret over actions that we took versus ones that we didn't, I think, right? Like, like it's like right. the cause and effect. I actively made a choice to do this. And so this is, if there's a negative result, it's a lot more impactful than like, we can't really, it's hard to comprehend Well, I didn't do this. And so I don't know. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, no, like, is that making right. sense? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think that's, that's behind the mask psychology as well. Really? Well, because so the idea it's like mask is something you're it's, it's something you're not doing, as opposed to like wearing a mask is something you are doing. And, and you know, um, you could see it as something that you're doing to compromise everyone's liberty. Like, look, you're giving in to the authoritarian state, but because that's how that's part of the logic of it becoming so political in the U.S. The mask wearing, right? But this is the thing: is it? It didn't. It doesn't have to be political. Like it, that's not the the ultimate end point for all mask wearing. Like first of all, like face coverings have existed before we needed them for a pandemic, and they existed for many different reasons. Like even one as innocuous as like wearing a balaclava in the winter, right? Like, but you know that was a bit of an extreme example. It doesn't have to be like. I public health does not have to be political. I mean, I truly believe, like, I don't think, I don't think a, a lot, you know, all Canadians are thinking like, oh, you know, the libs or the conservatives want us to wear this mask. Like it's, it's like an education piece around, this is how d disease and illness works. I think it's more, there's an ethical or philosophical impact of public health that was always present is the idea of like, triage and who do we whose lives and whose well-being do we prioritize over others like so the whole debate around like well schools are still open so as a society we have decided that it is more important it's more important to have kids in school and to ensure their future through education than it is to completely lock down and experience the negative impacts of that that would spread into the rest of like, affect other people it's, it's more to do with freeing up their parents to go to work though yeah it? that that's what i'm saying though right if we if we kept children at home then parents wouldn't have to wouldn't be able to work and that would be bad for parents and and the economy but we've decided that well i do think that the other reason is to give like to set people up for a future i have seen i've seen some kind of report that talked about like Cal I don't know how on earth anybody would do this, but calculated the loss in salary, like average salary per year or per month out of school. So there's like a future ability of, of, of people to, to, to be or not to be in poverty. However, we basically said like, there's no denying that like schools are a place where people are going to be able to spread the virus, but it's more important to keep schools open so that parents can go to work so that we can keep it our economy going rather than, but that's more of a priority than really quashing the virus entirely. And that's, that's the decision that Ontario is making right now. Yeah. <laughs> so I think my point- the whole model, Yeah, because the whole model of, of because you, you, you couldn't pay every parent the same that you pay a teacher to take care of children because there'd be way more parents being paid than teachers being paid. Like, like, cause you could, cause you could say, well, you know, if, if adults have to stay home with their kids, just pay them to do the childcare because they're the ones who need to do it during the day rather than paying them for their normal job. But, yeah. but unfortunately this is why we have school in the first place. Cause yeah. it was way easier to get one woman back in the day to get all the kids into a single school, <laughs> single room schoolhouse and deal with them during the day. It's just an efficiency in our society, like farm, having one person right, to farm. Right, so yeah. they're all not all growing gar our own gardens, right? Yeah. It's the same idea. Um, scaling up. Sorry? Scaling up. Scaling up. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not going to, like, I like, I believe anyway, school is a good thing, but. Some <laughs> in some quarters they're doing like learning pods right like like a one teacher teaches the kids of like a couple different families who are like in a pod together in the first place who are like bubbled yeah. in the first place but i mean <laughs> they, they could they could have been trying to organize that with the ontario school system you know they could have been doing a lot of outdoor classes 
they, they could have been you know breaking into consistent smaller groups you know it, you, you create some jobs um but like i just you know i guess they can't they don't have a way gen generally the state can't turn on a dime like that no that's that's the the, the system the machinery the fact that we've being able that that the systems have changed as much as they have is like kind of impressive. You know, vir we Zoom existed before <laughs> the pandemic. Virtual, I think about like virtual care, telehealth, all of those things existed, but there were so many barriers, right? Oh well, you know, you have to make sure the client is a resident of Ontario. You have to make sure you're using a PHIPAA compliant encrypted system to do your virtual care. And then the pandemic happened, and we realized that. There's an inequitable access, right? Because only certain institutions can pay for encrypted software, or you know. So eventually, we just threw up. People threw up their hands, and like the colleges as well, finally relented and said, like, yeah, you can use Zoom. Just talk about risks and benefits. But sometimes it takes these big events to shake things up. But I agree. Like I wish our education system, our education and healthcare systems, could certainly be shaken up a little bit more. It just it really just sucks that it takes on like these big ne negative events, I think often for that to happen. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that can happen is like government regulation of monopolies, right? Because that's, you know, for the, the, for the worshipers of the free market, they have to understand that it doesn't work when there's a monopoly, right? And which means that as much as you might think that like there's something impure about government regulation, well, not as impure as the whole thing being ruined with monopolies. I mean, because there's no innovation then. Like Facebook's not innovating because it's a monopoly. The education system has a monopoly, so they just do their thing. They're like, well, this is how it is, you know. <laughs> there are private schools. And the political parties have a duopoly. There are private schools. There's private and public health care. So not entirely, I wouldn't say it's an entirely a monopoly, at least in Canada, I can only speak to Canada. Um, and it, is Facebook really a monopoly when we have many other social media well, platforms? Like what does Facebook bring to the table that no one else does? For, with the school, it's a monopoly on the education of poor people, not on all education. Um, except, except for the, there is this choice with the Catholic school board. Um, um, or homeschooling, I suppose, even though that's not really a product or a service per se, but right. oh, homeschooling. Oh, yeah. But yeah, like I was saying, it's not really a, a well, product or a business. What, what I was thinking should happen with schools is that, you know, every, every parent should say, oh, we are now, quote unquote, homeschooling our children. And we are contracting, you know, private teachers to, to, to do this with a different teacher to student ratio to reduce the spread of COVID because the school system can't spread that quickly. But in principle, memes could spread among parents that quickly, but they'd say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pull all of our kids out of school and we're going to rehire all the teachers via like create a separate organization on paper, offer to hire all the teachers who were working for the public school system and hire more adults as well in order to have the numbers. So you'd have smaller learning pods, not just for affluent families, but for all families. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know if like cultural thinking can change that fast either. Um, Cause you know, like it's, it's, you know, it's easy to sketch a solution that like, oh yeah, just change everything. That'll, it's like, okay, how do you change everything? <laughs> it, 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 it takes all, it takes time to, to, um, you know, cause you, it's true. You, there is this, you want to double, triple check a big change and ever, you know, cause everyone can agree that, that we need a radical change but not on which one because maybe there's five such plans that people could dream up. And then you have the meeting and nobody can agree on which they're like, well, okay, well, let's just make some changes to like the system that we've got. Yeah, that, that's a lot easier to do than tabling the idea of completely dismantling an institution uh, as one may have uh, observed earlier this year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with a lot of these collective actions, you, you, you ideally would have more coordination ahead of time. Um, you know, like, because if you're just one parent, and you're like, I'm going to take my student out of school as a protest, because in principle, I believe that everyone else should do it and form learning pods, or whatever to make COVID spread less. Um, just because you think in principle, that should work doesn't make the collective action work. If, if you don't have any, um, 
because you, you, need, you need the means to coordinate these kinds of things. And, and you know, it's harder to do that with Facebook than it used to be speaking. You're, you're asking about what way, in what way Facebook has a monopoly. I mean, I mean, who do you, you, you mean, because Twitter also exists or before I move on, I just want to say that I don't think taking your children out of public school as a form of protest is very effective because the schools are very happy that you like the and the government is very happy that people would be taking this on themselves right oh oh I guess oh no we have smaller classrooms we don't have to hire yeah, as many like, people right you, you, um you, 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 like, you first have to pass a bill it would almost be analogous to the the Corbyn rule that they're proposing in the UK that when a when a company becomes publicly traded that first the workers have an option to to buy it out but because workers generally wouldn't have the wealth to buy out the company the government would loan them the money in this proposal to to, to buy yes them. okay that, that that's a good that's a well, good point so but I, yes you were saying about facebook and twitter well, well in the, but in the school in the school case just to complete the analogy there because mm -hmm. it's not a, it's, it's, it's not a, an exact analogy but um you know I, imagine if you know um if you don't have your kids in school you i, I mean it, I don't even know, maybe there is some kind of tax credit like this, where if you don't have your kids in the public school system, you get, they give you the money to di divert it towards their education. I, I, I guess not. I guess it's just, you have to fund it all yourself. Because, you know, imagine if it was like, you know, like we need this much money per student to educate them according to the state's education model. And, you know, if you take your kid out of school, then you, you get the money to, to educate them somehow. It's not going to be like, uh, going back to the efficiency piece, right? It's I the money it takes to educate a single child for a year uh, in a public school. I I don't know how long it would go if you just took that money oh, and tried to well, do it yourself. Well, I mean, so ideally, it would, it would happen collectively that some organization would would be would be sort of doing collective bargaining and say like, well, mm -hmm. okay, we're gonna we're gonna uh, you know we're gonna because because you reduce the spread even if only like ten percent. Of students did this right because if you know you have these large classes if you're able to take 10 percent of students and put them into smaller learning pods because some parents effectively take their money their money quote unquote out of the system and divert it to this other organization that's going to educate people in smaller sizes i mean this is all just to get around the red tape of the education system can't ch make these changes really quickly and unilaterally there's no like i mean the alternative you could you could appoint some kind of czar to like redo to temp temporary education system authoritarian to redesign the system i mean it's it, you know it's basically uh i understand i would only agree to that power. if it was a lottery right. and i don't i would only agree to that if it's a lottery of of current teachers that's interesting well that sounds like a good idea to me tell me more about this lottery i still don't think it would be a good idea but oh. if i had to but well, yeah i mean i think that someone on the front line would be the best person to obviously with support of, like you know because redesigning a system requires skills that are very different from teaching but in fact i would i mean yeah i was i was about to say even a committee would be better but that kind of throws the thought experiment out of the window but i always thought it would be I wonder what a society would be like where our leaders were people who weren't in it for the glory or the authority, but people who had lived, uh, had experienced the results of leadership, you know, and are now put in this position and making decisions. Like, I just, I find that, I think, I don't know, I, I, I think there is, Barack Obama, apparently there was, he didn't necessarily really want to be president from what I understood initially. Michelle didn't want him to run. Michelle didn't want him to run. He wanted to run though. He always was, was gutting for that top position. Last I heard that uh, it was more so Michelle that didn't want him to run after he'd already gotten the Senate seat. Oh, that's fair. I'm okay. Sure well, I'll take it back. There's gotta be other examples of people who find themselves in positions of authority. I think no, I, you know what? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna backtrack that. Nobody gets into authority completely by accident. <laughs> I think that sometimes there are people who are pushed a little bit more than others, and some people who seek it more directly. And I wonder if the people who are kind of pushed to do it because, like, well, I really wish somebody else would do this, but nobody else is around, and so now I have to do this. And I think that's the better kind of leader, in, in my opinion. 
Yeah, I mean, although you have to wonder why is it that anyone finds himself in the situation that they're the only one who will do something that needs to be done. I mean, sometimes this is the bystander effect. Social loafing or, or like, may not, not exactly imposter syndrome, but like, so sometimes there's like something that needs to be done that like anybody could do. But for some reason, most people believe that they shouldn't. Because it's like, oh, it's a mind your own business thing or something like that. Or like, Sometimes you're the only qualified person, like on a very micro level at one of the organizations I work at for a while, I was the only person doing going into people's homes. And there's a lot of reasons for why that was, was I thrilled about being this person who was going to lead the way and like, I, you know, no, I mean, I would prefer not to go and, and have contact with people. Right. But I remember that feeling of like, okay, I think this is me. I'm the only person who can so basically like there's one big organization that provide, well, the CNIB provides services for blind people or people who are, live with blindness or low vision. And they had stopped doing all of their home visits and, and instructions. And there's people who really needed, you know, help around home, around safety concerns. And I, for a while, I don't know if that's changed, but I was like one of the only people who was providing that service in Toronto and I thought, well, it's me. I guess this has fallen to me. I didn't really choose this. Um, I feel like given everything I said before, I feel like I'm, my, my point isn't, oh, I'm like the best leader because uh, in a way, but like sometimes, I don't know, sometimes we find ourselves in situations where we, we have to do it. We didn't really actively seek out this specific. I'm sure a lot of, there's a lot of frontline workers like maybe they didn't quite exactly sign up for what they're signing up for, but they respond to the, they rise to the call. And so I wonder if that principle could be, I don't know, it feels like there's not a lot of incentive for us to capitalize on that principle, but I wonder what our society would be like if, if we reflected more on that and how, what makes people rise into the challenge versus saying, thinking that they're all that in a bag of chips, for lack of a better word, and thinking, Oh yeah, I'm totally the best person to make all these decisions. I think a little bit of humility or uncertainty in a position of leadership, I think is helpful. <laughs> yeah, I mean- What do you think? <laughs> well, I think there's some cases, there, there are some cases where there's gonna be a, a, a meaningful difference in expertise where there's other cases where really people should just take turns being in charge. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And that's, uh, yes. I think that <laughs> I remember um, my partner the other day said like, why did Obama have to, to leave? Why couldn't he have just been president forever? I'm like the same reason why Donald Trump has to leave and can't be president forever. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> like a reason for this. Too long and they had to change it again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's when they instituted term limits, right? After FDR. And I believe he was originally given these kind of emergency powers due to the depression. So he, but he had, you know, a lot of pressure on him from the labor movement and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When did the eight, the four year term, when was that a thing? Was that in the original constitution? No, no. Cause FDR. That's terrifying. <laughs> hmm? No, it was because FDR had more. FDR was very popular. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, just goes to show and things can change. Yeah, <laughs> they need to, right? Yeah, I mean, you can make a rule against changing the rules, but then is there a rule against changing that rule and so on? Yeah. I don't think it's, you can't make a rule about changing rules. Well, this is called the paradox of self-amendment, which is where the game Gnomic was originally defined in this book about this. I mean, it's related to the paradox of the stone. Can God make a stone so heavy that he can't lift it? That kind of thing. Right. <laughs> but, you know, just... It, it, the Christian God being a paradox doesn't mean that he's not a good role model because like you won't actually, you won't personally achieve paradox. Sorry, what? It, 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 you know, the Christian God is supposed to be the set of all perfections or something like that in like the like Cartesian theology or whatever. I thought Jesus was supposed to be the, the role model, not God. God was kind of like, well, he's supposed to, on one view, he represents your I ideals or, or like a idealization of, of the values that you already have or something like that. And any rate, so like, like if, if you think that like uh, power or agency is a good, then God being all powerful, 
all powerful represents a, a a ratcheting up of the volume on that trait of like, well, what if you maximize that? So like God says, we like all powerful and like all good and all knowing. It's just like mm. turning all the dials to 11, basically. And it's like, you know, it's effectively dials don't go to 11, but with God, it's like, no, he really goes to 11. He's like, like, like more than logically <laughs> possible. He's got all these good things all at once. I always thought like God was the guidelines and then Jesus was sort of like the application of the guidelines in, in, in the practical sense. Like, I think that nobody can, nobody can be God except God because it's impossible for us lowly mortals to be at 11. We don't have that dial. Um, so rather than, I feel like a role model ought to be somebody you could actually emulate, but maybe I'm just being pedantic. Well, that was, I think that was sort of their loophole around not having a direct representation of God anyway god's ability to have omnipresence is one of the involved in one of the proposed solutions the paradox of the stone because god could be in two places at once failing to lift the stone while standing on the earth while also lifting the earth itself that he's standing on while failing to lift the stone <laughs> this is the, the the weirdest solution i found in the discussion of the paradox of the stone yeah, I mean, I don't really think there's a problem with making a stone so big God could not lift it. So that's what he wanted to do. Like, well, then, there are things God cannot do, I assume. Well, okay, so suppose on Facebook you had the ability to um, to, blo to block yourself, something like that. <laughs> like, um, um, basically there's, there's different ways to max this it goes back to the uh, freedom in america thing because there's different ways to maximize freedom you because you could give someone so much freedom that they have the freedom to give up their freedom i mean yeah technically most people do have the ability to give up their freedom i mean i'm no legal expert my, my understanding is that uh, freedoms tend to be more inalienable in the u.s Oh, I was thinking about mo things like personal things, like, I don't know, bondage. Oh, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? Of that too, historically <laughs> and regionally. I'm sorry? There's differences in the legality of that too, historically and regionally, like how much you're legally allowed to consent to. But yeah, I mean, in all fairness, there was a situation where somebody gave consent to be eaten. And I think the it's people who yeah. did it still were jailed even right. though the person gave up, right? That, that, that freedom, so. Yeah, I'm not sure what the legal grounds there was if that right was deemed inalienable in general or if that person was deemed mentally ill in that specific case, um, you know what I mean? Seems I, awfully convenient to me, I mean. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I don't know, maybe they had a model of what would be a more sane reason to want somebody to eat your body. I mean, <laughs> they're like, well, yeah, but he had really bad reasons for, <laughs> Well, are people who donate their bodies to science insane? Like somebody's coming in and, and dissecting them and chopping them up and looking at them and some, you know, I've seen some things like people not being the most respectful. Sure. But if, if I signed a contract for a million percent interest, would I be insane? Depends. It depends on the contract. Like if that, if that, you made that work, good for you. Well, it's like, you know, like in Canada, there's a legal limit, except for payday, payday lenders have an exemption that you can't legally charge more than 60% interest. I did not know that. Yeah. So if I try to do 70% interest, that's, you're not technically allowed to agree to that because I don't have a payday lender exemption because <laughs> they have a special industry for having really bad interest rates. I mean, like, yeah, I guess there's also... At, at times, you can have your rights taken away from you if it if you people deem that you're not capable of making good decisions. And so, in our I guess these laws or these got these rules are in place because no one, I guess we've decided no one in their right mind would ever take a loan with that much of a percent. But I yeah, guess it's like there's a lot that that is debatable. Or something like that. Sorry. Like above this threshold, they probably didn't read it. <laughs> Yeah. Like they probably thought it said six, not 60. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but anyway, I find that that's, um, I mean, um, I'm, I'm kind of new to, to thinking more about like um, legal philosophy and stuff, but um, so far I'm having trouble finding any answer to um, any sort of philosophical 
published answer to a question of like what principle determines which rights should be inalienable and, and you know you know which because i think it boils down to this question of there's different definitions of freedom because like we yeah. could say, like we could say oh, well facebook is limiting people's freedom in various ways so how would you define a software system that maximized people's freedom as opposed to making them polarized and you know um compulsively addicted and so on but there'd be different there'd be, there'd be different kinds of, of of freedom freedom you could have in, in the system um you know like like um like, 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 like the freedom to make a post so private that even you can't read it. <laughs> um, that would be the freedom to take away one of your own freedoms. Or um, I, I'm sure there'd be people who would complain if you had a social media system where you couldn't moderate or filter what was coming in. Like people would feel like, well, I don't have a choice of what I get to see. Is that taking away someone's freedom? Is that removing options, right? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the things they're talking about doing, um, in addition to, to um, splitting up Facebook and Instagram and also reviewing section 230, which is the thing that makes them um, not liable for what people say on their platform currently. Um, and they're talking about giving people choice over the algorithms that, um, you know, imagine if you could use Facebook with Twitter's algorithm and Twitter with Facebook's algorithm, um, you know, like, basically the idea is that, that like running so is that like running a mac software on a pc like i guess i'm just kind of wondering like, are those algorithms compatible across like platforms it's more like using google in internet explorer <sighs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> i mean using bing in chrome uh oh. <laughs> it's getting worse i guess i guess that's the if that's freedom so be it <laughs> Uh, at, any, at any rate, like, like if, if, um, like these kinds of paradoxes in theology would correspond to things like infinite loops and in programs. If the people were like voting to create a program, like imagine if everybody voted on how to create Facebook, but he created an infinite loop due to some paradox like this. It's like, that's they, if the people had, a, if the people have the freedom to create a paradox of their collective will, maybe that's too much freedom. I mean, this, this is related to the issues with, um, Condorcet cycles. So there's this guy okay. Condorcet in the 1800s who sort of studied these things. So like, suppose that like, it, it can work out mathematically that over half the population prefers Trump to Hillary, over half the population prefers Hillary to Bernie, and over half the population prefers Bernie to Trump. And it's just a rock, paper, scissors circle like that. Um, it's, just, mm. it's, just, it's just different people who are in the majority or minority each time. And that's mm -hmm. called the Condorcet cycle. So it's like a rock, paper, scissors situation. So just saying like, oh, majority rule. It's like, okay, but what about in this situation? Oh, yeah. Right. Okay, well, back to the drawing board for democracy. Um, <laughs> but um, at any rate, the, 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 the simple, I guess we, we should probably draw to a close here, but um, the, the, the sim simple theme that I've been trying to draw out is just that um, people don't question what they mean by freedom. And that creates these interminable disputes about like, oh, well, is wearing a mask less freedom or more freedom? It's like, well, for who, for one thing, but yeah, there's, there's more than one. We, we, we could, all, not everyone agrees, but even if we did all agree that freedom was one of the most important virtues, that still wouldn't solve what we meant by freedom. And there's, it, it means a lot more different things than people might have originally suspected. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I think that's what I'm ranting about. What, 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 what do you feel we should cover before we draw to a close? Um, I was going to bring it full circle and say when it comes to freedom, some people will never be satisfied. How do you mean? I mean, I had a song in my head at the beginning of the hour, and uh, I just wanted to, to bring it full circle and to say musicals are the answer <laughs> when it comes to discussions around freedom. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing is we're going round and round about what people ought to and ought to not do and how we ought to create systems and do run our politics. And I think it's it's not about freedom versus responsibility. It's just about what is freedom. I don't think it's a dichotomy. I think it's, you know, I think we could really dig into that term yeah. and figure out what does it mean to what does it mean to be free? What kind of freedoms are important for human beings, right? Um, and are there universal freedoms? I'm not even sure anymore, to be honest. Um, well, hopefully that's progress. 
What do you mean? Apparate, you know, at the end of a Socratic dialogue, people are like, I don't even know what I believe now. <laughs> and it's like, that may or may not be progress, depending on your view of, of uh, philosophy or anything like that. Well, I think it is. I think it's something that, you know, I mean, people need to think, should think about and discuss and eventually we'll settle on something and then life will go on and we'll have more so, pieces of information and it's it'll just continue to, to move in the cyclical nature, I guess, much like forming and dissolution of other systems. Yeah, I mean, my hunch is that if we just go meta enough, some of these questions become more tractable. Like I think sort of like, like meta voting, like electoral form is kind of like meta voting. And Wait, hold on. Are we going up to the level where we're d debating free will now? Because if we're not, if you don't even uh, have free will, like freedom doesn't even exist. So what well, no, do you need no, to talk about it? No, I mean, I, I think we should define free will so that it does exist so that we don't just give up on the political project of having more freedom. Like, I, it, it's not exactly compatibilism. It's more like a, a linguistic prescriptivism. <laughs> of saying, I know. It, it might as well refer to something. Like, people have, people have limited attention. And, and people clearly want something. They want freedom of some kind. And so here's a thought. Find philosophically what they want rather than just telling them they can't have it. You know, like, you, you know what I mean? Because, because like, you know, controlling societies or like coercive control in relationships, they're very real psychologically and politically. And to philosophically distract them by focusing the conversation on something which uh, it is metaphysically impossible and also not really the kind of freedom that people want anyway, is, is just, it just politically disables philosophy. So here's a thought that I had about how we could move forward. Maybe something that we should be striving for is in the meanwhile, where we don't know what freedom is, maybe it's a noble pursuit to maximize people's ability to make choices, whatever they may be. So, um, you know, whether that's providing, like we talked about universal basic income, right? Providing people the necessities of living, trying to reduce stress, which makes it hard to make decisions and consider alternatives. Education promotes freedom, like you said, with the freedom of thought. So all of those things, I think when you unify it behind the purpose of giving people as, as much ability or a space to consider alternatives, make decisions and, and have conversations, maybe that's, maybe that's the most important part of freedom that we should ought to be striving for while we're still figuring out the rest. Yeah, well, you know, it, it might come down to epistemic criteria, like like there's epistemic arguments for democracy and markets saying that somehow you're getting information maximized or like like truth can flow through the market from all these perspectives being combined. And I think in, in both cases, it's like, that's a nice idea, but only if certain other conditions are met. Like, as you say, if someone is very stressed, they, they're not a, a rational consumer, which mm -hmm. means you're not getting this supposed wisdom of the crowd as much as you could be as if you raised just the, the basic, uh, you know, the, the, the baseline so yeah. that people, because if that's what you want, a market of rational consumers, then you need some basic regulation to make sure that people aren't, aren't don't have so little surge capacity that they're not going to make these long-term rational decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and we're never going to have infinite the, the, capacity. The, the, the tiebreaker is truth. That like, if you have to choose between different kinds of freedom, the kind that produces more collective knowledge and understanding is is better i mean it was not going to solve every aspect of the tie but yeah i think then that kind of responds to what i was going to say which is the idea that like at the end of the day we have a finite we freedom is going to be a finite resource no matter how much we try to provide people with the like right like i said food shelter a, a calm place from which to be rational um strategies on how to do so like there's only 24 hours in a day, you can only make so many decisions. And uh, so I think the ones that maximize information, like you said, um, and freedom and choice are probably the best way to go. Well, food for thought, Naomi, thank you for joining us at Live Stream of Consciousness. Um, I, I think uh, our listeners will hear more from both of us very soon. All right, thank you, it was a pleasure.